Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington. It's Thursday, October 7, 2021. We're joined shortly by Stephen Van Meter, aka the Bond King, talking about markets and what's happening in a broader macro context. Here we are at the end of the day. Equities rally. Looks like uh, on the day, NASDAQ and Russell 2000 are the big winners. Uh, looks like closing out the day on NASDAQ up about 1%, 14,654 at the close. Also, we should say short-term deal reached on the debt ceiling today on the Hill by Democrats and Republicans. At the end of the day here, uh, looks like oil's rallying a bit. Let's bring Stephen Van Meter into the conversation. Stephen, welcome. Ash, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to have you. So, Stephen, uh, obviously the action on Wall Street to the upside here as we close out the day. What are your thoughts on what's happening today and in markets more broadly? Yeah, it's kind of interesting that and I don't know if the debt ceiling issue has been passed yet, or I think what I saw just before we came on is it looked like it was, and then there's some uncertainty. Of course, the market thinks that kicking the can down to December is is super bullish, and that is actually pretty baffling to me of how that could be a good thing. Uh, obviously, we saw the bond market sell off on some reflationary hopes, but, but really nothing changed other than we have this problem that now we have to still deal with. Assuming everything's passed and there is an in temporary increase, we're going to face this immediately again in, in December 3rd. I think perhaps maybe the bigger reaction to the markets is they're perhaps front running the non-farm payroll report tomorrow in hopes that it is going to be a big report and that we're going to see a lot of hirings coming in the next couple of months. Well, let's talk about all that. That's such a great point here. Kicking the can down the road has been the order of the day in Washington on the debt ceiling for as many years as this debt ceiling issue uh, has come up the last decade or so. Uh, I guess the feeling is there's always a deal that gets done and getting the immediate headwind off the table uh, tends to get priced to the bullish side. Uh, but back to your point, Stephen, some of the things that I most want to talk to you about today, uh, precisely the points you just made, the broader reopening trade, jobs, uh, and the macro backdrop, especially what's happening with inflation, what does it signal for the U.S. Treasury market? Yeah, well, if you if you look at the bond market, it's telling you inflation's coming. I mean, that's that's what it's trying to tell you right now. I also like to kind of suggest to people that bonds are future dollars. So if you look, the the dollar's gotten a little bit over ninety four. Looks like it wants to break higher to ninety seven, where you see a lot of resistance at. And what the bond market's trying to tell us right now is that it believes, it's hoping the dollar's going to weaken. Perhaps that would mean that there's going to be a, a big, you know, debt ceiling increase, a big budget that, you know, the markets would reinterpret as reflationary. But I think the, the issue we're really looking at is everyone's now convinced that whatever that number that prints tomorrow, it doesn't matter what the number is. I, it's, I start looking around and it doesn't even matter if it's a bad number. It's almost as if whatever number prints tomorrow, that on November 3rd, we're going to hear from Powell that we're going to get an announcement of a taper. Now, maybe the, maybe he will start the taper in November. Maybe it won't be till January. Although, Ash, I, I think it's kind of interesting. I'd like to can maybe see what you think is, do you think that the Fed could taper or initiate a taper without the the deficit, the debt ceiling being raised? See, I don't know that they can because that would be a dangerous game to play. So it, we're looking ahead, trying to guess what Powell's going to do. And I guess tomorrow's number, good or bad, is it? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I, along with everybody else, thinks the debt ceiling deal gets done just because it always does. That might be a bit of a dangerous game. I guess it's like thinking at a certain extent. Uh, you're going to get across the highway because every time you've run across it before, you've never gotten hit by a truck. Uh, I, you know, we wonder. Uh, I wonder, at least, I should say, about the level of broken politics that we see in this country. Obviously, that's a perennial topic and has been for many years now. We see some fragmentation uh, in both parties internally, which is an unusual thing. We saw it around the infrastructure debate, around the budget debate, uh, some defections from the left wing, the social justice Democrats in the Democratic Party, uh, who seem to have a different set of incentives, a different view of the world uh, from more mainstream Democrats. I, I, I don't know, man. It seems like a, a perilous time to me. It does. And it's just interesting to see these negotiations play out because we know for a fact that the, something's going to get done. And even if it doesn't, the notion that for the first time in history, the United States is going to have a technical default on its debt is preposterous. 
there's absolutely no way they're going to do that. They'll they'll lay off federal employees. Uh, they will do you know they will quit making payments on Social Security, Medicare, and all kinds of other benefits. They will not quit paying on the debt. There's absolutely no way they'll do that. And you start looking at this big battle, and both sides think they have everything to win, but so far no, nobody's winning at all. And the bond market's trying to say, look, we, we've got a problem here because all these people that are holding treasury bills right now that are expecting them to redeem are facing the reality that under a technical default, their redemption doesn't get paid. And as you know, Ash, the people hold T-bills primarily for liquidity purposes, not because you're going to get rich on the interest, but you're going to make a little bit just for your time. And if the operating expenses of your municipality or your business are tied up in T-bills and you're facing a technical default where you will not get your money, well, then you got to go sell something else. Maybe you sell your notes and bonds because you don't want to, but you've got no choice. And so you're seeing the bond market react heavily to this. And I, I think as soon as this is over that we see the bond market you know, head strongly the other direction. Yeah, a little bit of a primer here for people who are relatively new to fixed income. Bills are the shortest term instrument, then notes, then bonds, collectively sometimes confusingly referred to the bond market. Uh, Treasury bills are sold at a discount on face and then redeemed at par rather than being interest-bearing instruments due to the short-term duration uh, of the maturity. Uh, but the idea that Treasury is going to default on those bills, uh, to me, seems like a complete zero. Something gets done, some backroom mechanical deal. I don't know whether we start talking about the $1 trillion coin again. That's always a fun topic uh, for finance nerds. But look, I just don't see a default, a technical instance of default uh, by the United States government ever happening. No. And we saw the Biden administration yesterday kind of mention that the coin is out and you know they put on the White House website that oh by the way you know we can cut yeah you know, they didn't say that they they would but it said here's the things that are at risk your Social Security checks your Medicare benefits veterans benefits you know uh, employment I mean it's kind of like we are not going to jeopardize our staff as a world reserve currency we will sooner not pay you and that maybe will put some pressure when you get upset by not having your Social Security check and you'll call your congressman or woman and say hey. You need to pass that thing. And that's kind of politically a, a smart play. But the idea that the U.S. government, is, is, as a world's reserve currency, is not going to make sure that its money, is, its debt is good, is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I suppose there may be some fringy people in Congress who may want to do that. But it just seems to me that the Treasury Department, you have, you know, you basically have people who are uh, who are smart, who understand how important reserve status is for the dollar, uh, and they are not going to allow, in my view at least, uh, the United States to become uh, a second-rate power because of politics happening uh, on one end of Pennsylvania Avenue. No, certainly not. I think this is more of a political battle to you know make the Biden administration look bad by the Republicans, knowing that you've got the midterms coming up. And you start looking at both sides and start stripping away your political views and you look at just purely from you know two sides at a negotiation table and it starts to get pretty interesting of what they're all really playing for and it's not to do the right thing for the american public because if that was the case both sides would sit down and say look we need to do these things and need to do them now and we can go bicker and fight about the other stuff tomorrow but no this this is a high stakes poker game that both sides realize that the midterms are the win and uh, who who reigns supreme I guess we'll find out. Yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely a political question. I dread talking about politics here, but sometimes we have to just because it impinges on markets. I would only add one more point. I'm not sure there are even two sides anymore. With all the fragmentation that we see politically happening in Washington, uh, the calculus seems to be becoming more complicated. Yeah, it, that's that's probably very true. You know, I like to remind people uh, the first rule of a, a goal of a politician is to get elected. The second one? get reelected. If you think anything else matters in between, well, see the rule number two, get reelected. So yeah, we, we could move on from that. Maybe we could talk yeah. a little bit about uh, the, you know, the, the taper and why all of a sudden Powell is just so eager. You know, uh, It just seemed like a, a meeting ago, he wasn't interested in tapering at Jackson Hole. And all of a sudden, he's like all over this thing. Well, let's jump in and talk about exactly that. By the way, I love your prior point. Uh, cynicism is always bipartisan. Tell me a little bit about what you think uh, the chair is responding to. 
how he sees the world, what his option sets are, and why there's been, uh, at least from a perception standpoint, a change in messaging. And, you know, I think, Ash, it has a lot to do with fiscal stimulus. So I was thinking about this earlier today as we were going to get ready to talk of why is this sudden pivot? I mean, it wasn't that the last non-farm payroll report was good. There's some view that this one may not be spectacular. I mean, we, we have 7 million people in the last two weeks that have come off unemployment benefits. 7 million people. Now, we know because the time, you know, it's not like in the movies where you walk in and you pull the help wanted sign down and you walk in and hand it to someone and next thing you know, you're on the payroll. We know this takes time, but there's a huge bet that perhaps that between November and December, the holiday season, that these 7 million people are going to fill all every available job and then some. And But I, I'm not sure that that's the, the reason either. I think it has something to do with fiscal stimulus. Because for a while, you could argue that all of this QE was simply balancing out the fiscal stimulus. So you look at fiscal maybe being fire, and you look at QE being water, and it, it was really just kind of balancing each other out. But now that the fiscal's gone, all of a sudden, and there, and there, obviously we know there was no signs from Congress that there'll be any extension or that. Next thing you know, boom, pal pivots, and you start wondering why all of a sudden would he be so eager to taper? Is because when you understand quantitative easing, and a lot of people fixate on the term easing and quantitative, and they can throw that word out because it's meaningless. Quantitative easing tightens until it eases. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is. The whole purpose of QE is to lower and su or suppress interest rates until you get one magical thing that occurs, and that's called lending growth. And if you look at all loans, at least as a commercial bank, on a year-over-year -year basis, there's zero over the last 12 months. I'm sure you saw the credit data as I did uh, today. Oh, it went down. So we're getting the impression that the well, last couple of months, consumers are paying down debt. So why would Powell need to at least back off or and maybe he's not going to completely taper down the purchases to zero because we have to remember he was doing QE prior to the pandemic and it was unrelated to the pandemic, is if he continues to run QE at this pace without having some balance from fiscal, he's going to tighten financial conditions. I think we're seeing that in the dollar. And if the dollar shoots higher, interest rates come crashing down and he can't back out of it. And Congress is so busy doing, well, nothing, as we just talked about, that there isn't going to be any fiscal to come to balance out his continued continuation of QE. Well, you know, Stephen, those are some incredibly important points. In many ways, the heart and soul of that argument right there that you've just stated. Let's walk through and unpack it a little bit more uh, for people who are relatively new to this space. You're talking about effectively the ability of quantitative easing, uh, effectively finding a way of lowering interest rates almost below the zero bound by buying uh, by buying bonds, agency debt, uh, loading up the Fed balance sheet uh, to effectively stimulate credit creation and lending growth. Now, it sounds like what you're saying implicitly in that is that there's a risk uh, that there's a tipping point with the amount of quantitative easing that can occur, whereby you get a paradoxical effect or the opposite effect that you're looking for happens. And perhaps, perhaps that Chair Powell sees some evidence that maybe that's happening right now and wants to start to reverse. But I don't want to put words into your mouth. Does that sound like a fair characterization? I think you've got it, because what you, when you understand what quantitative easing does is it traps money, deposits, commercial bank deposits from retail customers, such as, say, myself, could be commercial deposits, such as, say, my business, and it traps them in the commercial banking system. And so it crushes the volatility. It limits their movement. And since there's only eight uh, global systematic important banks, where, which in, inside the U.S., and only really two of them have, have taken on most of the deposit growth. You see B of A and J.P. Morgan due to uh, Wells Fargo would have, but they're in the penalty box from the long list of things that Wells Fargo does that nobody seems to like. Uh, and you, you start looking at the situation and you say, OK, Powell's doing all this QE and trapping dollars in there. But what did he have? He had this big flow coming in from fiscal. So he, he, he could wash all of this fiscal money through the QE machine. But without that flow of money, he starts tra he ha he continues trapping now even more of the existing money, and he crushes volatility even more, and that tightens financial conditions, and he loses control. So he's really all of a sudden he's got to slam on the brakes on this thing, and that 
I think the one thing that surprised me, Ash, and I, I'd love to get your take on this, is when Powell mentioned at the last presser that they were going to kind of— the, he, he, I don't know what the, I remember what the exact words, but it was almost like a, a gentle easing, right? We're going to slowly taper. And it was like, oh, what's that going to be? Six months. And it was like, wait a minute, a six month taper off 120 billion a month? That's not, that's not gentle. That feels like we're tilting the, the nose of the airplane down. So, uh, I, but the more I think about its ties to the fiscal stimulus and all these reserves getting trapped in the banking system, system that, you know, inhibit their velocity, it starts to make sense of why he wants out. Yeah. And let me just broaden the uh, the conversation a little bit for people who are uh, who are listening to this now, uh, who are trying to get their heads around exactly what we're talking about. So the taper, what we're talking about is reducing the additions to the balance sheet. I think this is an important point for people to understand uh, because it is not actually contractionary. It's just less expansionary at the margin. So what we've seen, and if you look at the chart as I am looking right now, uh, WLCL at the St. Louis Fed Fred database, this is the total assets of the Federal Reserve, less eliminations from consolidations. What you see on that chart uh, is a basically a 700 and some odd billion dollar balance sheet uh, going back uh, to uh, 2004 and rolling up to where we are today, which is a hair's breadth under eight and a half trillion dollars. So a massive expansion of the balance sheet uh, over the last, uh, call it 16, 17 years uh, since the beginning of the great financial crisis uh, in 2000, uh, late 2008. What we're talking about doing here is the Fed gradually reducing the amount at which the balance sheet is expanding. Uh, so this is, a, this is a challenging thing to get our heads around, I understand, uh, but this, this really is the core of what you're talking about, Stephen. Exactly. And I like to look at it as you're driving your car, you got you know your foot smashed on the gas pedal, and all you're doing is starting to lift it back a little bit. And that's all they're doing. Even if they stop quantitative easing, they're still going to continue to reinvest all the interest that in, in coupons that are maturing. So right. it's not that the balance sheet won't grow, it's just going to grow at a snail's pace. And then I think there's another factor here, Ash, that's being overlooked. And, and I already checked the auctions coming for next week. And we don't see it there, but at some point, the Treasury is going to reduce its note and bond issuance down because they're not borrowing as much money. And obviously, we have a T-bill shortage, so we know that they can't continue running uh, these big note and, and bond auctions. So you look at the fact that those at some point are going to scale back at the same time the Fed's going to scale back. So is there really much that's going to happen? Maybe not. But the risk then is what if the Fed can't? stop QE because something happens in the economy and the Treasury's backing off its issuance, all of a sudden now you're talking about a lot more pressure on the downside of the yield curve. Yeah, so we're talking about going faster at a slower rate. Right. It's the beauty of second derivatives. Uh, you know, we've been talking a little bit about the implicit risks of the strategy about deposits being trapped, about the impact to individuals. I wanted to just bring up a clip uh, here, this is uh, Kyla Scanlon talking to Mike Green uh, at the Simplify Real Vision event that actually talks about some of the impacts, some of the effects on individuals, uh, particularly younger people that we see from the current financial environment. Let's take a look at that clip. I think it's really a perfect storm of all of that. So like there was with GameStop happening, like everybody was like, wow, we don't trust anybody. Like, and you still see that show up in the Wall Street bets forums where it's like, oh my gosh, everybody's lying to us. Like it's this big Ponzi scheme. And so I think like TikTok and the creators on there, it's like, okay, this is just one person. I see them, I know how they interact. Whereas like institutions themselves. So like if you go invest with BlackRock, like you don't really see BlackRock. Like you don't see a person attached to that unless you have a financial advisor, but that's like a whole different level that Gen Z people just don't have access to because they don't have money. And so you don't have like these institutions really speaking to you know 17 to 27 ish years old because they don't have the money yet that those people don't mm -hmm. um, so institutions just ignore them and so they have to find other avenues to learn and that ends up being social media and I think that like just the, with the creator economy in general that people really are seeking out some sort of connection and the past year with the pandemic has really highlighted that because everybody has missed out on, on that like human connection so people are really seeking out like these um, individuals where they can learn from because they haven't either gotten that from institutions, don't trust institutions anymore, and are just finding different avenues to get the information that they want. Well, there you have it. Young people don't have access to traditional financial institutions, and social media 
fills the void. Stephen, we were talking a little bit while we were on break there uh, about what you see happening in yields. Let's take a look at the scoreboard. Walk us through what you look at when you look at U.S. bond markets. I should say uh, U.S. T10s, this is 10-year U.S. Treasuries, uh, now yielding one spot, 5-7% up. Uh, up pretty uh, about 20 bips uh, here over the last, uh, call it two weeks. Yeah, good question, Ash. I really pretty much focus on where the long bond is at. To me, that's where the most interesting part of the game is played. And it, it, from uh, my self-anointed title of the Bond King, well, you know, a lot of people don't understand, you know, because I'll get emails or messages saying like, hey, I don't understand why you're in this for the yield. I'm like, I'm not. And it's for price appreciation. And, and when you understand duration, and you understand duration across the curve, there's one way to play duration if you think yields are going down, if you want to make the most return for your dollar, and that's out the long end. So that's the, that's the part of the curve I'm most interested in. Now, if we can continue this a little bit, there, there's this notion, Ash, that, okay, you know, the long bond can, is going to go to three, four, five, six. I mean, everything's just, it's, it just has to go up. And then for some really bizarre reason, every time rates go up, they get rejected, and there's people just don't understand that. So I think we could talk about that a bit. Yeah, so uh, U.S. 30-year uh, Treasuries right now uh, trading at a yield of about two spot, two one two percent. Again, same pattern we see on U.S. T10. A rise. Uh, this looks like about uh, looks like about 25 bips uh, here, going back to uh, going back to September. Tell us what you're seeing there uh, and how you interpret that data. Yeah, you know, I, I love this because one of the things I hear all the time is, oh, yields are you know going to go up because of technicals or this or that. And then, you know, you pull up uh, any Real Vision interview with Jeff Snyder and he will mock technical analysis of, of any yield you've got. And I, and he so he let's let's put it in a way I think a lot of people can understand. And maybe you can pull the data for us um, from yesterday on the refinances, the mortgage data. What did we see? A big drop in applications, pretty substantial drop, almost, I want to say almost 10% on refinances. We saw purchase applications fall. Is that what you see, Ash? I'm sorry. I have to be honest oh. with you. I was just looking at the questions that were coming in because my oh. Twitter feed oh. is absolutely <laughs> lighting up uh, with people who want to ask you questions. Oh. Uh, so uh, well, I actually, go ahead. Well, let, 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 me, let me just share the story of what I pulled up because there's this whole idea that rates can just go up. And I want people to understand there's an equally a supply and demand component in the bond market as there is anything else. So if I have a business and I sell widgets and I have a store full of thousands of widgets and they're not selling, I can do several things. One, I can keep my price the same and hope they sell. I could raise them, direct myself, raise the price. Maybe that will bring people in. But generally those two things don't work. You have to lower your price. So if you look at yields, and we see refinance this data crashing this last week, and I went and pulled and said, when did when did bulk of the refinances happen recently? Well, they happened in March of 2020, when when the yields were 30 year yields were 1.2. They happened again in January 21 and August of 2021 when yields were at 1.85. Now I'm not the smartest math guy in the world. But if you just told me the 30-year yield to two, one pushing higher, why would I refi if I have already refied at 185? So let's take this to another level. So we look at the purchase application. Well, they they started peaking in late 2020, going all the way through uh, March of 2021. And the purchase application data peaked at a rate of 2.5% on the 30-year. So you look at now someone who bought a new home, they can't, if you got something at two and a half percent, if that's where you're 30 years, you're not reflying at 2.1. I mean, there's not enough money there for you to save to do it. So you start looking at why is the refi data going down? Because people don't need to refi at these higher rates. They're not going to. And this, then again, it comes back to the supply and demand. If rates are going higher and nobody's borrowing, what is a bank going to do, right? Because you're a bank, you're lending money and you direct your staff, raise rates because I want to make a bigger profit. And then the sales team comes in and says, hey, boss, no one wants to borrow at those rates. Do you keep raising them because that's the secret? No, ultimately, this is where you start understanding the monetary system will start pushing rates down and the banking industry will push them back down because you have to go where you can find people to borrow money, where there's demand at, 
And right now that demand is lower than it is now. Yeah. Speaking of the financial system, Stephen, I want to jump in and hit some of these questions. The first one comes to us from Gregory from the Real Vision site. Uh, this is a great question because uh, I know that it's one that lots of our viewers have wondered about in the past. The question is, Steve, what role do you think the reverse repo facility is playing, a tightening function or a lifesaver for money market industry? Uh, the reverse repo market is keeping rates from going negative. It's, that's, that is exactly what it's doing. If it wasn't for reverse repo, uh, we would see negative rates on the uh, in, in bill yields, and we'd break the buck, and the financial system would break. So uh, I I don't know that it's either on net tightening or easing. I'll just say this: whatever it is doing, it is saving the system. So whether if it is tightening or easing doesn't matter. What's mattering is it keeping rates from going negative. And is the implication there to to piggyback on your prior point that this is a, a represents a suppression in the aggregate demand for loanable funds at those rates? based on the current economic conditions. Beautifully said. So you think about this, all this cash flows in from fiscal into the banking system. What do you need to do if you're in the, the banking system? Well, you want to get matching loans, get that money lent back out. Well, there's not a demand for all this money. There's so much money that there's just not enough lending demand. And so as this cash just stacks up, what does it do? It drives rates lower. Again, we, you got to think of this as supply and demand. Why? Because the lower rates go. Let's say the rates went negative, right? And, and people are like, well, that can't happen. Well, sure it can. It's not that the banks aren't going to lose money. I, as the depositor, are going to lose money. That's the idea. So if rates were to go negative, and at some point, people are like, hey, that's a good deal. I'll go borrow. Depositors take a hit. Now, we know that depositors don't. That, that's not part of their math. You know, The idea is I put money in the bank. My money is good. It can't go down. We can't break the buck. But again, this is a supply and demand component. The Fed is literally just keeping rates from going negative. And it's not helping because there isn't a demand to borrow at even this pathetically low rate the Fed is offering. I, you know, I, Stephen, to your point, I just wonder, though, what happens then? Net interest margins go negative as, as rates go negative. I mean, do, do banks just become wholly owned U.S. government utilities? I, it, I mean, the, the world starts to look really really weird with negative rates. Not, not if it gets passed to the depositors. See, everyone thinks the banks would take it. Well, where do you think the banks get their money now to lend out? They get it from depositors. Now, depositors aren't benefiting much in interest right now. But if the banking, if, if the industry said, okay, look, here's the deal. We've got too much money. We need to lend it out. And by the way, uh, if you have money on deposit, instead of paying you a positive interest rate, we're going to start paying you a negative. You're going to start paying us. It doesn't even have to be a negative rate, right? Yeah, you know, I bank, for example, at Wells Fargo. Is there any reason Wells couldn't come out tomorrow and say, oh, Steve, by the way, for every account that you have a balance, say, I'll just arbitrage say over $10,000, you're going to pay us 10 bucks a month. Is that a, not a negative rate? Could they say you're going to have a fee of 50 bucks a month? And consumers would be oblivious to what's going on. But they could eventually say, look, we could charge you 100 bucks a month or 1,000 bucks a month. Why? We don't want your money here. And until it gets lent out, well, you're going to pay to have us store it. So yeah, it's completely a supply and demand issue. The, the depositors could easily uh, handle this. And the banks, the banks who still make money on because they're going to make money on the origination of the loan, not the loss of the yield the depositors would take. Yeah, and maybe that's just the point, which is banks always figure out a way to make money because it's the purpose. <laughs> it is their reason for existing. <laughs> right. We don't we don't run into too many cases where banks make big mistakes. Now they do. Obviously, we've seen that in, in during financial crisis. But in general, they're really good at making money. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I should say we're answering questions right now coming to us from the Real Vision Exchange, from the Real Vision site, uh, from YouTube and from Twitter, where you can hit me up at at Ash Bennington is my handle. Here's a nice simple one that comes to us from Tim O'Neill from YouTube, Stephen. The question is, how high would the 10 year yield have to rise? before it became a problem for small caps and financials? Well, I think we're starting to see it now. Uh, and that's that's the whole issue is why I went through uh, the the notion that all these people that were refined and looking for, um, you know, to perhaps borrow money. I mean, again, it's no different than if I had a classic car, how do we know the value of it? Well, we go look and see who else is transacting right. that car. Now, what if it's a one-off car that never no one else has? And it's a value to a million dollars because some insurance company says it. 
But if I sell it to you, Ash, for 1.2 million, well, guess what? We just established what its value is. And this is the same thing in the loan market. If people aren't borrowing, they can't go up that much. And yeah, at some point, and maybe we're there now, it starts to impact the equity market because rates have to go down. And how do you get rates to go down? Money's got to go into bonds. It's and that's why we don't see this big secular increase in interest rates that everyone thinks is going to happen. That, oh, it's going to be the 1970s all over again. Go back to the 1970s and look at all the lending demand. We have nearly the opposite now. Nobody wants to borrow money. So, yeah, I think we're pretty close to seeing rates being high enough where it is impacting the market. Yeah, this is a fascinating point. Let me see if I understand what you're saying correctly here. Basically, you're saying you need to look at rates on a relative basis. Obviously, you can look back uh, on the chart here. I'm looking at the uh, 10-year Treasury yield chart going back to 1991, at, uh, excuse me, 1981 at almost 16%. Uh, now at one spot, five, seven, as we have this conversation. But what you're saying is, hey, Financial conditions depend on the aggregate amount of supply and demand of funds. So you can be at one and a half percent, you could be at one percent, and you can still have tight financial conditions because there's insufficient demand to borrow those funds. You got it. You know, I remember when my uh, dad moved to my family moved to Bakerfield. Of course, I was very little. I, my dad would tell me a story where he says, "Well, we got a thirty-year, uh, a sixteen percent on a variable, and now." Me being older and wiser as a dad, that was pretty stupid, you know? Uh, why didn't you get a fixed rate loan? He goes, well, son, they didn't have fixed rate loans in because that's what they had and that's what you got. And then the rate went to 18% the next year because there was demand. But today, there right. just is no demand. And the only way we could get rates up, and I know this seems weird, is we just don't have enough demand. And when you start understanding rates from a banking perspective as from a business perspective, you get that aha moment. Stephen, this has been great. It's been an absolute clinic talking about borrowing, lending, rates, macro conditions, inflation, price levels. Fantastic conversation. Well, appreciate it. Well, and that kind of just tie, ties back to the clip from, you know, uh, the Simplify event of why people are going on to social media and looking for answers. And it's not just people, it's not just millennials, it's financial professionals. Because even at my level, you just don't have access to this broad base of opinions that you can go learn from. And so it's a real powerful tool that hopefully, you know, by listening to Real Vision and, and this show, that people will think more about what's going on and get smarter. Yeah, extremely well said. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. And thank you, everyone, for watching the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Tomorrow, Jack Farley sits down with Jared Dillian of the Daily Dirt Nap. Same time, same place. In the meantime, we'll see you on the Real Vision Exchange. Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh -huh.